Okay, welcome. So in this video, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about Ethernet, but really lead us into VLANs, virtual local area networks. So uh, our situation here, our topology, uh, what we have, let me make sure you get the right color here, is we have a single IPv4 network slash 16. So all of these devices here are in the 172.16 network. Okay, they're all connected to the same switch, or it could be any uh, group of switches, but they're all in the same broadcast domain. So just to, uh, let's take a look at things here. Let's just ping, take a look here. So I'm at uh, this device here. So IP config, I see my IP address. I do not have a default gateway. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, let's see if I can ping. Let's ping the device right next to it. First of all, Take a look at the ARP table, right? No entries in the ARP table. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a ping 172.16.20.20. I press enter. Okay. Now that first ping may fail. Oh, they're all going to fail because I got the wrong IP address. All right, that's not going to work, right? There we go. There we go. 172.16.20.60. There we go. That'll work. I was going to say the first ping may fail because of an ARP request. Of course, it may fail because of a Rick types in the wrong IP address. All right. If I do ARP A now, what happened is this PC here sent out a ARP request, a Ethernet broadcast, and said, hey, whoever out there is 172.16.20.60, send me your MAC address. Now that was a broadcast that was sent by this device here. Okay, the switch received the ethernet broadcast and flooded it out all ports. Okay, so everybody saw the ethernet broadcast. Only this device says, hey, that's me. These two ignored it. And it sent back an ARP reply, a unicast. Okay, matter of fact, if we look at the ARP table of this PC here, 172.16.20.60, we'll notice that it has the IP address and associated MAC address of the PC that sent the ARP, re ARP request. This is actually part of the ARP request. Okay. So the receiving device can put the IP address and the MAC address of the device that sent the ARP request in its ARP table so it has it to send Ethernet frames back. If we take a look at our switch real quick here, show MAC address table, we'll see that the switch actually learned the MAC addresses of both devices. Okay, And it does that by examining the source MAC address of every frame and the incoming port number of every frame that comes in. This is this device here is on, uh, well, I can show you, let's go ahead and wand over that. Fast Ethernet 01, and here's Fast Ethernet 02. Okay, so this, this device here, this is the MAC address of this device, this is the MAC address of this device. All right, um, so no problem here, right? Okay, let's extend this a little bit more here. By the way, these devices here, their operating systems do not record the, the ARP. Let me go here. When they see the ARP request, they do not record the IP address and MAC address of the device that sent out the ARP request. Okay. All right. And that's because most devices really don't care about everybody else. They only care about what they want to know, what they need to know at the time they need to know it. All right. Let's go ahead and make a slight change here. Okay. As you can see, through the magic of me pausing the recording, I made a couple of changes here. I've actually divided our slash 16 network into two subnets slash 24 each. Uh, we we did this by extending the subnet mask by, 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 and by borrowing bits from the host portion. So this third octet is now our part of our network. 
So notice our mask has changed slash 24. So first 24 bits are the network portion. So we have 172.16.10.0 network slash 24 and 172.16.20.0 slash 24 network. I say 172.16.10.0 slash 24, 172.16.20.0 slash 24. Okay, so we see down here I've actually made changes on these devices as well. 172.16.10.50. I've changed the mask slash 24 of each. Yep. So let's take a look at this device now. And I see that my ink to go is going to get in the way there, but that's all right. Let's go to desktop. All right, we'll move it like that. Okay, so uh, prior to this, we were able to ping 172.16.20.60. Okay, let me check my ARP table here. Okay, yep. all right, make sure that it's empty. Okay, can I ping that device now? We haven't made any physical change, so let's take a look. Ping. Let me just do the up arrow. 172.16.20.60. You're right next door, right? Where are you? Where are you? Okay, this is going to time out. But we didn't make any physical change, did we? It doesn't matter. Okay, let me let this continue so you know there's no magic happening here. All right, so it failed. Okay, you know what? And it's going to fail. Even if I had a cable that directly connected these two devices, they are not going to be able to logically communicate with each other. And what do I mean by that? Remember, devices live in a bubble. So this device here lives in its own bubble. All it knows is what its IP addressing tells it. And its IP addressing tells it that it can reach directly from its NIC card to any other NIC card for a device that's in the same network as itself, like this device over here. Okay, That's our job is to make sure that this happens, Okay, that these devices are on the same side of the router, the default gateway. <clears throat> the only way it's going to be able to reach devices on another network, it says, oh, the only way I can reach you, I don't know you're in my same neighborhood or not. I don't care. All I know is if I want to send a packet to you, I need to send that to my default gateway. So let's let me let's see, make sure that these devices can, can communicate. And then we'll talk about how this device can communicate with devices on other networks. All right, let me go ahead and pause the recording here just for a second. Okay, let's just make sure that this PC can communicate with this PC. <clears throat> and that's going to lead us into another discussion. So let's do ping. I'm on 172.16.10.50. Ping 172.16.10.70. Okay. And that, that ping works. So if I do an ARP, what it did was it sent out an ARP request. And let's talk about this. Okay. So what happened is this. This device here, I'm going to use blue here, sent out a broadcast, an Ethernet broadcast, an ARP request. And it says, hey, you're not in my ARP table 172.16.10.70. I know your IP address, okay? but what I don't know is your MAC address. So it sends out an ARP request. Whoever has 172.16.10.70, send me your MAC address. When the switch receives this, it sends that, it's an Ethernet broadcast. So it floods it out all ports after recording the source MAC address and incoming port number of this frame here in its MAC address table. If it, does, if it knows it already, it resets the five minute timer. That's another, another video, okay? But what's important is this, the switch floods the broadcast out all ports, but the incoming port. So look, look who saw this broadcast. First of all, this device here saw it, right? That's me, okay? And it's important that devices on the same network as 172.16.10.50, the device that sent the ARP request, that everybody sees it. But it's not important that these devices see it. This device 
devices on our 172.16.10.0 network, our blue network, are never going to send an ARP request for devices on the red network, 172.16.20.0 slash 24 network. So they never need to see those ARP requests. Okay. So not only is it wasting some bandwidth, wa wasting a little bit of CPU time there uh, on the end devices, could also be somewhat of a security issue as well, uh, depending upon our, our uh, our network and our, our topology and what we're doing. But anyway, what's important here is that we don't, these devices here are seeing broadcasts that they do not need to see. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at something else. Okay, so I wanted to uh, do a little erasing there. What if we want these two devices to be able to communicate with each other? Well, in that case, the only way they're going to be able to do it is via a router. So let's throw a router into the mix. I don't know. I'll just grab this 1941 here. All right. I'm just going to move this down and make a few connections here. So let's uh, connect. Let's connect the routers gigabit 01 to the switches gigabit 01. We'll make it easy. And the router's gigabit, I'm sorry, gigabit 01 to 02. There we go. Zero, let's see here. All right. Let me move that right there. Okay, so what you can see here, I've added a router to our topology here, and I've configured two interfaces. I'll show you that in a moment. But th this router's interface is 172.16.10.1 slash 24. And this router has an interface with an IP address 172.16.20.1 slash 24. This is what a router does, is it, is it commit, connects one network to another network and also allows us to reach remote networks as well. Okay? But very common that a router is going to have at least two IP addresses on two different networks. Okay, so uh, by the way, you'll notice that these devices here, let's take a look. I made a change here and I've got some colors happening all over the place here. So hopefully we can still see this okay. But let's do IP config again on this device. And you can see I made a change here. So I gave it the default gateway. So this device, along with this device here on the 172.16.10.0 network, this is their default gateway. Okay. These two devices here, let's take a look at 172.16.20. You can see I made the change there in Packet Tracer. So let's do IP config here as well. All right, sorry about all the colors there, but I don't think you can see it all right there. So that's this device here, 172.16.20.1 is its default gateway. All right, so let's see if we can get this device now to reach this device. All right, so back here at 172.16.10.50, let's again do ARP-A. All right, so it still has the ARP, uh, the MAC address, uh, an IP address for 172.16.10.70 in its ARP table. By the way, we can erase that if we want, delete that. Let me try to do this in Packet Tracer, ARP-A. It's not important that we do, but I just want to show you we can do that. The amount of time that these entries stay in the ARP table is dependent upon uh, the operating system. Usually on client operating systems, we're talking under a couple of minutes. Windows, it's even under a minute now. All right. Anyway, so let's see if we can ping. Okay. So um, ping 172.16, this device right here, 20.60. Now, what's it going to do the Mac? What's it going to do the ARP request for? Is it going to be this device? I don't think so. I'm not gonna, never it says, hey, I can never reach you directly from my NIC card to yours. I got to go through my default gateway, right? My my router. So who do you think the ARP request is going to be for? Let's take a look. Now, it's not uncommon for that first ARP request to time out because ARP request, that first ping to time out because the ARP request.
Uh oh, what I do here? Let's take a look. All right, let's do that again. Uh, spanning tree. So I didn't have the link lights shown, but it was, I was, I just finished spanning tree, uh, finished converging. So uh, let's give that another shot here. So once again, let's do IP config. We can see here's its IP address, default gateway. Let's check the, let's do, uh, make sure the ARP tables, again, empty, ARP dash A. Okay, let's ping the device right next door. 172.16, how do you spell 16? 20.60, all right. That looks better. Okay, the first one timed out because of the ARP request, got the ARP reply, but we see we got replies now back from this device. But let's check that ARP table again. Look the entry in the ARP table. Okay, right. It's not for the destination MAC address. No, this is for its default gateway address. That's where it's going to encapsulate all the packets in the Ethernet frames for the destination MAC address of its default gateway, this MAC address for any device going outside its network. But let's talk about that broadcast for a second. So when that ARP request, which is a broadcast, I'll put a B for broadcast here. When it enters the switch, it's switch sent it out all ports, but the incoming port. So it went out all these ports still. So again, all these devices are gonna see it. Now the devices that do need to see it would be anything on its same network. So this device would wanna see it. This device would want to see it. Of course, the ARP request is not for this device, but these devices down here would never want to see it. Okay, these devices on another network and this one up here. Okay, so again, single broadcast domain, this works. Okay, we can actually have devices on different IP networks. Okay, there's a better way to do it than how I'm showing with a router with two interfaces, but the point is, that we can have devices on different IP networks communicate with each other without VLAN. Some people think you need VLANs for devices on different IP networks to communicate with each other when they're connected to the same Ethernet switch. That's no, it's not the case. Okay? Just that we'll see the advantage of VLANs here in just a moment. Okay, I'm going to lead us into that anyway. Okay, but the issue here is broadcasts. Okay, or single single broadcast domain. What's a solution for this? Well, let me pause the screen and show show you one solution. Okay, so I made a little bit of change here. I'm showing you the link lights. I'm making sure uh, spanning tree has finished converging. Okay, let me turn off those link lights. I usually have them on, but we don't need them for this presentation. Okay, so let's do this again. Let's do an ARP request. This time, uh, yeah, let's go back here. Explain this a little bit. Notice that we have all the devices and devices uh, in the 172.16.10.0 network in the same broadcast domain, connected in this case to a single switch. We have all the devices client devices or end devices in the 172.16.20.0 slash 24 network in the same broadcast domain, in this case, connected to a single switch. Yep. So what this means is this time, let's have, when, the, when this device sends out a ethernet broadcast, whether that's an ARP request for this device's IP address or the uh, MAC address of the default gateway, it's going to go out these ports here, but it is not forwarded by the router. So these devices will never see broadcasts that originated from this network here, just like this network will never see broad Ethernet broadcasts that uh, originated from this network here. The router blocks those broadcasts. 
Okay, let's just make sure everything's working here. Uh, let's go right here and let's just make sure. Let's go down here. Okay, I'll do ARP dash D again. And ARP dash A. Okay, let's uh, hey, let's ping the device right next to us in our network 172.16.10.70. Great. Now let's ping the devices in the other network. Ping 172.16.20.60. Okay. Time out to do the ARP, okay. Time out waiting for the ARP request. And let's do now, now this one shouldn't time out because it already has in its ARP table, let's take a look here. It already has in its ARP, whoops. ARP dash here, there we go. Already has in its ARP table, the, the MAC address associated with the default gateway. So it doesn't have to send the ARP request for that again. So this shouldn't time out when we try to ping this device. Okay. So let's do that. 20.80. Shouldn't time, oh, why is it timing out? The ARP request. Now this device knew the MAC address for the for its default gateway, but the router, let's go to the router here for a second. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. The router did not have in its ARP table, the MAC address. So that's why the first one timed out. If I was to do either one of those again, both this device and the router both have the associated MAC addresses for the IP addresses they're trying to reach in their ARP tables. Let's just do that again real quick here. Okay, let's do 60, no problem. No time out there. And let's do 80. And I wanna mention something about that ARP table again. Notice that these devices in their ARP table will only have MAC addresses for devices in their network. We'll never send an ARP request for devices in this network. Okay, let's take a look at the router real quick. Okay. Um, so here's the router's two IP addresses. It has an IP address on each network. Its routing table shows us directly connected to both networks the 10.0 slash 24 network on gig 00, zero and the 20.0 network on gig 01. Okay, by the way, yes, the router has an ARP table. I mentioned that it had to do an ARP when it sent, when it received a packet, do this over here, when it received a packet to send to these devices here from over here, it has to encapsulate it in a MAC address from its source MAC address from associated with this IP address, but destination MAC address to each one of these devices, depending on which device the Ethernet frame was going to. So yes, it participates in ARP and has an ARP table as well, as you can see right here. So there's the uh, IP addresses for the two devices in this network here and their MAC addresses. Just like here, 10.50, there we go. There's its IP address and its MAC address. All right. Now, one last thing to lead us into VLAN. Let me move this out of the way. Let me pause just for a moment. Okay. So, by having a separate switch or switches for each of our IP networks, we segment our broadcast domains. But this could be an issue with, what if we don't have that many devices associated with one IP network? Okay, we could be wasting switch ports. So one thing that we could do is, wouldn't be nice if there was a way to combine these switch, these two physical switches into a single switch Okay, a single physical switch, but somehow 
think you'd see what I'm getting into here, somehow separate, say, hey, virtually, this is one switch. And virtually, this is another switch. So still making it one single physical switch. But the devices are connected to this virtual switch. These ports here are separated from these devices here that are connected to these ports. So what does that, what would that mean? Well, what that means is this, that broadcast, that ethernet broadcast, that ARP request that comes in on this virtual local area network port, VLAN port, let's let's give it a number. I don't know, I'm gonna give it a VLAN, let's give that these 10, these blue ports, the VLAN number 10. Maybe you see where I'm leading into. <laughs> we'll be talking a lot more about this. What should we call these red ports? I don't know, let's give them their own number. We'll call them, I don't know, VLAN number 20 maybe, all right? Okay, so what this means is, once again, getting back to our ethernet broadcast, it came in on this blue port, this VLAN 10 port. It says, well, you know what? Came in on a VLAN 10 port, this broadcast. I'm only gonna send that out VLAN 10 ports. Because my job as this switch with two different VLANs is I'm segmenting, I'm acting as two separate switches. And that's what's happening. That's what happens with what we call VLANs, virtual local, local area networks, VLANs. And that is a topic that we'll be talking about in other videos, including my video series, my playlist on campus network architecture, where we build out VLANs and a lot of cool stuff. But this is a great way to take one switch and and divide it into separate broadcast domains, make it look like separate switches. And we can have actually, you know, actually uh, thousands of VLANs on a, set, on a certain switch, on one switch. So anyway, this is a great way to uh, be make better allocation of our ports on that switch. Again, this is one physical switch. Okay. And we will divide it port by port into these different VLANs. In this case, VLAN 10, that's what this is called. And this is VLAN 20, two separate broadcast domains. Pretty cool stuff. Later videos. All right. Hope, hope this video helped uh, bring a few things together and look forward to seeing you in other videos.